Welcome to the Gooder Podcast, where we talk with powerhouse women in CPG about their journeys to success. This episode is sponsored by Retail Voodoo, a brand development firm guiding mission-driven consumer brands to attract new and passionate consumer base, crush their categories through growth and innovation, and magnify their social and environmental impact. If your brand is in need of brand positioning, package design, or marketing activation, we are here to help. You can find more information at www.retail-voodoo.com. Hi, Diana Freik here. I'm the host of the Gooder Podcast, where I get to talk to the powerhouse women in the food, beverage, and wellness categories about their journeys to success and their insights on the industry. Thanks again for joining us and welcome to those of you that are new. Really quick, this episode is brought to you by Retail Voodoo. Retail Voodoo is a brand development firm. Our clients, our clients, I can say that easily, right? Include Starbucks, Kind, RAI, PepsiCo, Hi-Key, and many other market leaders. We provide strategic brand and design services for leading brands in the food, wellness, and beverage and fitness industries. If your goal is to increase market share, drive growth, or disrupt the marketplace with new and innovative ideas, give us a call and let's talk. You can find out more at retail-voodoo.com or email info at retail-voodoo.com and we'll talk some more. Today we get to meet Miss Maria Littlefield, who is the co-founder and COO of Owls Brew. Maria has been chosen by Forbes as 30 under 30 among food and beverage entrepreneurs and has been selected as 35 under 35 food entrepreneurs by the Specialty Food Association. Yes, I love that group. Maria is the co-author of Wise Cocktails, which came out in October of 2015, and is a book, cocktail mixer book about tea cocktails. So be on the lookout for that. Well, welcome, Maria. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much. How are you? I'm doing great. And you are on the East Coast. Is that right? Yes. New York. New York. Proper city? Proper. Oh. Right, right in the heart of it. <laughs> yes, yes. All, all the good, all the good, and all the mayhem. <laughs> yeah, all the good and all the mayhem. Well, I'm really glad that I finally was able to meet with you. I think I told you before we started recording that I've had a girl crush and been following Al's Brew since the very beginning. So a little bit of opportunity to kind of meet somebody yeah. that I admire for the work that they do. And well, I'm um, flattered. Thank you. <laughs> oh, sure. Of course, of course. So let's just start with the, the basics. So this is what I ask everybody. I want to start with your brand. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Owl's Brew and why it exists? Sure. Um, so Owl's Brew, well, to take you kind of back to the beginning, the, okay. the whole idea with Owl's Brew was always this idea that you can drink better. Um, and that when you were having a cocktail, you didn't, you don't need to have like all these weird additives and everything that we kind of peeled away as we started looking deeper and deeper into this category. Mm -hmm. Um, but it really all started, um, Jenny, uh, had a family member who was ill and she started, um, researching ingredients that added benefits Mm -hmm. and, and she stumbled upon the whole world of tea and botanicals and was just like amazed that you could drop something in water and have antioxidant properties and immune boosting properties and vitamin C and all this incredible stuff, not to mention also like make these incredibly delicious uh, blends. And so um, she started blending teas in our office. We worked together at the time in marketing and uh, first she started making me non l teas. And, you know, at at that time we were also pretty social, having a lot of cocktails and uh, both were really just like sick of like how terrible you felt the next day after right. having most of the cocktails. <laughs> like I yes. don't know why bu- you need to have a bucket of sugar every time you have like a tequila cocktail. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And um, so we started making cocktails using tea and botanicals as a base. Um, and first of all, they were like freaking awesome. And we were like, oh my God, why is no one doing this? You had all these incredible flavors, but you also had this just like really clean, delicious beverage. Um, and so that was really the the initial insight that we started. Um, brewing tea for friends and hosting tea cocktail parties and uh, doing all sorts of stuff like that. Um, And realized that, you know, people, we weren't the only ones who felt that way. And like people still like to drink, but also drink, know what they're drinking when they're, they're drinking. And yeah. um, So yeah. So Al's is a boozy tea company and we make all uh, clean, clean ingredients. 
Clean. Everything we do is as yeah, made from whole real, real stuff. None of that, none of that funny stuff. None of that <laughs> funny stuff. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So you and you and Jenny work together before Al's brew. Is that right? Did yes. I hear you? Okay. Yep. We were co-workers at a marketing firm. Okay. So you guys knew each other for a while. Yes. Uh, kind of a fun fact. Um, Jenny actually hired me the first day I moved to New York as an intern. No. <laughs> so um, I have been working with Jenny my entire time in, in New York. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Oh, I bet there is some, I bet there is some really interesting stories back there to talk about. That's a, a opportunity to do a boozy tea over that. I, I will tell yes. you. Lot, was, we have all the stories. <laughs> we have all the stories. That's like 14 episodes. We're going to have to yeah. record this. But I was, uh, I'll tell you, I was, uh, I'm working on, mm. on getting my MBA and this was joining me last night as I was, uh, excellent w- working on my paper. I was like I wondering, I'm like, how more, how boozy is this going to go? How, yeah. how creative is my paper yes. going to be on good, the good ethics study, of business? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my you know, goodness. sometimes you get the creative juices flowing a little, you know, a little like, bit, a little yeah. bit. We'll see what that grade comes back at. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Let me oh know. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, so tell us a little bit about the early days. Now you said you tested th- the concept out with some friends and families, but in the dis- development process, was this literally just you guys in the kitchen or, or was this, um, were you working with R and D like why? So beverage, were you working with beverage companies? Like, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, to be honest, it really started in a kitchen. Um, we, uh, used to literally brew in buckets, um, and make different concoctions. And we actually, um, kind of paralleled, uh, paths at the same time, Jenny, um, also, so Jenny kept brewing and blending all different teas and she started doing, um, tea blends for restaurants and coffee shops and hotels oh. in the city. Um, it's all like sweet greens teas and um, public hotel and Momofu group and a lot of really awesome partners with our tea company, which is our first mm-hmm. kind of foray into this space, um, brew lab and uh, brew lab. We actually exited. We, we no longer own that company, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Um, that, that's how we, that, so we started that. And then we started making tea cocktails and buckets. Um, and literally like we would just, blend up different things. And at events, we always were like, Hey, do you have water? And like, some of these are some of the funny stories we're talking about. Cause you know, people would be like, yeah, we have plenty of water and you get there and you're brewing for like a thousand people. And there's like an automatic sink. And you're like, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Or like brewing in our hotel room. Like, Oh funny no. About our art Basel. We were like doing some events and we were supposed to um, be allowed in the kitchen, but it was like too busy. And they're like, you just have to figure it out. So we like brewed for 500 people. Oh with, like, my gosh. There's some rum company in our hotel room. So uh, no. lots of stuff like that. So, so we literally started brewing in buckets, like no exaggeration. Um, and, uh, actually as, so that was really how we like, tested the market and understood like what flavors work and what people were really drawn to. And, um, uh, long story, story short, um, we launched the mixers first, which I, I'm sure you, you know about. And then yes. um, re- most recently launched our boozy teas. But for both, it's been kind of like a really eye opening experience. And this is when we we really started to understand some of the kind of hidden things, if you will, in the mm-hmm. industry mm-hmm. is when we went to produce what we were doing. Um, everyone directed us to a flavor house and they're like, oh, yes. no, no, you have to go to a flavor house and they'll remake your flavors. And yes. we're like, why? We, we just brew it like this. We want this and we do it in our kitchen and it tastes great. And right. plus you're getting all the benefits because you're drinking fresh brew tea. And um, everyone directed us to a flavor house. And yes. so then we started looking into like, what the heck was a flavor house? And like, yes. why, well, you know, and then of course, like the whole world of natural flavors is a right. whole other thing we can talk about. <laughs> yeah. But right. not, not so natural made from chemicals. Um, and so th- that was the kind of the, the craziest moment for us. And then um, it took us a really long time, both with both the mixer and boozy teas to um, find partners that would actually fresh brew the tea. And that has been one of our like non-negotiables from the beginning um, mm. is actually using whole real ingredients, nothing added. Um, and that's why we say we're a clean boozy beverage because mm-hmm. we, we don't use natural flavors, no artificial flavors, like no mm-hmm. sugar substitutes, none of that weird stuff or funny stuff as I said before. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, it was, it was really hard for us to find a partner who was willing to actually fresh brew the tea because that process is not something that, um, people are doing in beverage right now. Right. Now you have a common threat, a common story here when you know, we rebranded dry 
soda, not this last time, but the time before it's been six or seven years when we rebranded and Sherelle's who's the founder of dry soda had a very similar story where she had been directed to take all of her flavor innovation to a flavor house. And as part of our brand development with her, we said, you need to bring that back in because at your size and what you're trying to do in the market, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. I think flavor houses have their place, but when they're, when you're working, like when you're a brand like Al's brew, and you're pretty confident that you know what you want. Sometimes those flavor houses can talk you out of things that are right for you and the brand. And I, that's that was probably a really hard and some fierce conversations that you guys had to have with yourself and then yeah. with with your team, right? Absolutely. And I mean, it's all, you know, it's it's hard to stick by your your core all the time, right? And like, of course, there's easier, there's easier paths than the one we've taken. Right. Um, <laughs> certainly. And, you know, a lot of people use them too, because they're, you know, more cost efficient and all that kind of yeah. stuff. But, um, but you know, that's, that's not why we started this. Yeah. Uh, you know, we started this to have like a cleaner way to drink and better, better for you products while you're drinking. Yeah. Um, and so that for us has always meant using like good, clean whole ingredients and absolutely making, figuring out how to make it work. Yes. Yes. Now, when you think back on your time, was there, I, I always ask is was there a singular, there's usually more than singular, but what, is there something that pops in your mind as being like this main aha that took you to in the right direction, or at least gave you that moment of like, you, you we've got something here. This is, this is headed in the right direction. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I saw your question about one singular moment. And as you just said, I don't know if there's like one singular moment, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but a, a lot of building of moments. Mm -hmm. Um, and this general, um, you know, when we first, first started doing this and serving our friends, you know, there was very little kind of, um, I don't know, understanding about better for you drinking. It was like when you were drinking right. it all, nothing mattered. And right. then there was a big non-alc movement on better for you beverages, right? Right. Like, the kombuchas and all the benefits and all the stuff that started happening in non-alk and really started trickling into alk and um so so i think you know we we've, we've been saying that queen booze beverage for a long time but i feel like there's just more general consumer understanding about mm -hmm. what that means and like mm -hmm. that that is a possibility and i so we've kind of i, I think we've we've really built along with that um, it's much less of like, oh, you can have like a good, clean beverage now. And people are like, oh, great. Like tea, botanical, boozy, clean, good ingredients. Like I get it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so I think that, um, for us, you know, I think we were really early into this kind of, uh, I don't know, trend, I guess you would say about, you know, just cleaner, hopefully it's not a trend. Hopefully, you know, it's here to say, cause I always say like, once you have something that's better using clean ingredients, why would you ever go back? Um, but uh, anyway, so, so I don't think it was one single moment, but I think a, a lot of building and I think a lot of education around beverage category in general, both the non-alk yeah. and alk that yeah. has, um, has really, you know, helped us build. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And then would you say that there was like, when did you start to see traction when you became this legit, legit CPG <laughs> brand? I don't know at what point does somebody consider themselves yeah. legit, what, what, but I'm just, what does that mean? Yeah. yeah, no, yeah. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Like when did you guys kind of go, okay, you know, we, we got in here or, you know, so-and-so invested in us was, you know, wh where was, where was the traction for you guys? Um, things. So we launched Boozy Tea at the top of 2020. Okay. Um, and I, I think that's really when, when things you know, really shifted for us. Um, the, the kind of conscious consumption from non-alk had just mm -hmm. started really to translate into alk. And I mean, I mm -hmm. think the seltzer category is a great example of that. Yeah. Right. Um, at least in terms of like people, sorry, you're good <laughs> thinking, thinking about, um, what is in their beverages and, you know, uh, I wouldn't, I don't agree with all their ingredients, but, right. um, they're definitely like lower carb, lower calorie, lower sugar, just, a, you know, a much like kind of stripped down nutrition panel. Um, which especially if you look at any of like the other FMBs and like, right. a lot of those heavy beers is way different from how people oh, were drinking, yes. uh, you, you know, five, 10 years ago. So, um, 
that that movement really kind of set the stage for us to build with what we have with Boozy T now. Okay. Okay. Good. So, and now at the same time as your brand is doing all of this, is there anything that is, you know, I always like to say that is when people are building brands, there's two kinds of learning. There's really probably more. There's the business of learning and then there's the you of learning. Like as you are growing with the brand and building the brand, were you finding any, any things were you finding yourself developing in certain ways that you found interesting or frustrating um, that was helping you or hindering you along the way in, in this, uh, in the brand's oh, development? Gosh, yeah. I mean, start off by saying every day's learning, right? <laughs> you, right? There's no like manual for, for building, building a brand and certainly not when you're, you're trying to do something that's different. Um, but you know, personally, it's like it, it, one thing to have, and I think Jenny would probably say something similar, it's, mm-hmm. you know, one thing to have this insight and this like, you know, true belief in what, what we're doing, but it's also everything that you're building around that to me mm-hmm. to make it succeed. Like, uh, you know, we've had to learn a lot of leadership skills and yeah. like, you know, we need an awesome team to help us build this. And so we've right. had to learn how to manage and grow a team. Um, and then, you know, from the in, inner workings of a business, it's like, everything from production to to sourcing to sales to marketing you know you you have to learn a lot of that and it's all very like industry specific in terms of like what works and what doesn't and what strategies work and Mm -hmm. um so so all of that but I would say that the biggest thing for us or for me has really been you know learning to be a a leader Mm -hmm. Uh, what um I leader has such a squishy definition what do you mean by that Within a team, you know, mm-hmm. growing and building a team and, um, and all the, all the things that go around with that, you know, yeah. helping to motivate them and, you know, everyone, I think for one thing that's been interesting for me is that, you know, I've, there's no, like, at least my, my leadership style. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, it's not, it, you I don't, you can't just manage everybody the same. Um, that's for sure. People need different things to grow and succeed. And um, our team is, is how we've been able to get where we are. I mean, they're like the most important thing to the brand. And so, um, making sure that we're, we're nurturing them and, and giving opportunities and mm-hmm. challenging them, um, and all, you know, sharing in our, our successes and our challenges together has been something that has been, you know, a big growth for me, I think. Mm-hmm. Now, when you kind of think back at this again, there's no like singular moment, right. But when you think back, what are a couple of those moments of pride that you have either for yourself as a leader or for the brand? You might have an example of both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say for the brand, um, it's always in, somebody tries it for the first time. Like that's always yes. what has driven me from the very beginning. Um, it's just the reaction of people when they try it for the first time. And there's like, you know, at one point we did like some funny videos about people's first reactions. Oh, it, really? It really, it really isn't like anything you've tried before. No. Um, and yeah, you're drinking one. I, yeah, I, <laughs> what, what, exactly. Tell us your reaction now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've got the especially especially the boozy teas, which the boozy yeah. tea was new for me because I was familiar with the previous, like the original, the OG yeah. Alsbro, and so the it's a it's a sophisticated flavor profile and yeah, it has a simpleness to it. And I can imagine even for those that have tried everything in the market, this is something that you'll have, a, you'll, there'll be a, a response like, because it is a new, it is new. Yeah, no, I mean, I love, I love hearing people's responses for the first time and like usually the excitement and the kind of surprise. Um, and for, so for me, that that's really that's, that's the best, that's the best moment. Awesome. Awesome. Now I want to talk a little bit here about, I just kind of zag for a moment, you know, you guys have been working and developing a product in a pretty male dominated kind of category. Um, beverage is, uh, just it's legacy. We're trying to build our way out of this. We're trying to, um, but not just women in general, but just diversity across the board in beverage. And, and of course that's part of what this podcast is trying to normalize is diversity. When you think back of 
when you first started versus now. Mm-hmm. Are you seeing the kind of progress? Are we moving in the right direction in beverage? And if so, like, what are you like going? Yeah, back then blank. I couldn't get a banker or an investor to open a door. Now it looks like this. Do you have any of those? Like, where's our progress been? Look, I like, I always like to think there's progress, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, um, I think we're seeing it um, more. Ob- I don't know the specific stats, but I would say more obviously yeah. in wine right now. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I think there's, I've seen, a, there's a lot of like awesome female founded brands that are coming mm-hmm. up a lot of chatter. Um, I think in particular in our category, um, we still have some work to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the beer category in general, I mean, uh, I think the statistic is about 4% of oh, really? women in leadership, brewmasters, salespeople are women, mm-hmm. which is a pretty, a pretty small statistic when you think about the who's buying that category, which is about 60% women. So it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And it's actually, um, that insight is actually what drove Jenny and I to start. We have a community-based program called the Wise Women Collective. Oh, Um, is this the book club? It's part, book club is part of it. Yep. Okay. Yes. The Boozy Book Club. (laughs) Boozy Book Club. (laughs) Yes. Um, and, uh, Anyway, it's it's just a, it's a platform that's meant to drive conversation and community building locally. We support like local women's events and local women's charities, and then we also do some more national programming. And we also have our boozy book club. <laughs> um, right now, we're doing a program with Keep a Breast um, for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Sure. We have some stuff we're working on for um, uh, Women's uh, History Month in March, and um, we partnership with Jane McLaughlin right now. And so, so just a bunch of. Uh, community building programs that, um, that we work on through that platform, um, with the hopes to just, you know, kind of bring more people both into the conversation, but also into the community. Mm. Uh, here's a fun fact for you, for your October, October women's October thing. The, um, yeah. the founder of Girl Scouts, I don't know if you were a Girl Scout, but the it was found- not, but I, I'm very familiar. <laughs> okay. So the founder of Girl Scouts and for the life of me, her name escapes me. Um, her birthday is on October 30th or 31st. I can't remember. And so the Girl Scouts internally do a big celebration about that. But Girl Scouts, of course, is all about developing girls into business leaders. Like that's kind of what the foundation, that's what the whole selling cookies is about is planning and finance and forecasting and all of those things that you would never think a third grader could do, but they do. Um, skills. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just kind of a different way, but along that line, I'm just kind of, I was talking with somebody, I don't know. It was a, it was a couple of few, um, podcasts ago that I, that I had where I was like, how do we break the cycle? Like, by the time, oh, it was, it was with Fumi um, at over at PepsiCo. How do we break the cycle of diversity? We can't do, once people are already adults, we've already kind of ingrained some, this is the way things are, this is the way things aren't. And as you guys have been talking in your group, have you guys addressed the whole, like, how do we get into high schools? How do you know, like, if you can't see it, you can't be it type of thing. You may not have discussed this at all, but I'm yeah. just saying like, how do, by the time they're in college, they've already, they're already headed in a direction. How do we get this interest sooner? How do we get that this thing is a brewmaster into high schools? Like, what do we do? Yeah. Do you, do you have an idea? Uh, you know, I think it's a lot of just about changing the conversation, like what everyone's doing now, like normalizing what these roles are for women, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it's just like a societal conversation is at least my opinion. Um, like you, you can be a brewmaster. You can have a boozy tea company. You can, why you can not? do all these. Yeah. Why not? Like it doesn't, you know, these gendered roles, I think we still have some work as a society to kind of break down. Um, yeah. And, so. and definitely having those conversations sooner. I think I yeah. just don't know where, where to insert it, where to put it in. Oh. I, I, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's interesting in terms of like the alcohol conversation, but <laughs> yeah. well, bever- but we just say beverage in general, beverage. right? Yeah. No, I, yeah. I, it's what you're, it's just, I, I would say like, I mean, maybe Girl Scouts, I, that sounds like, I mean, it's just normalizing the conversation earlier. Yeah. Um, and like, I think it's talking about these opportunities and talking about the different paths and yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I still think we have, uh, you know, it's like, oh, you can, we have certain roles that still play into a lot of yeah. gender stereotypes with you know, younger generations. So I think for we have sure to that down. Yeah. And I, I mean, I even want to say the same thing with alcohol, right? There's nothing wrong with talking about alcohol at a, at a young age. It's when we don't talk about it, that it becomes abused when it's older because it becomes taboo Absolutely. or whatever. So, you know, when my kids see that we drink alcohol and we talk about it and, and so I would say, go for it, you know, talk with, I mean, for those that are comfortable, I'll talk about anything with my kids, but no, it's, uh, I, I mean, and we're, our society is very different than a lot of others in terms of that conversation, oh, for sure. starting it. And <laughs> a lot yeah. of people talk about it much earlier and it's much more normalized and it's not like this, yes. thing you, you know, uh, yes. Yeah. We still uh, <laughs> bless the United States. We still yeah. have our puritanical roots kind yes. of embedded in the weirdest of places. If you ask Absolutely. me. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, to, to, you know, kind of moving down the line and where women are and aren't in CPG, I want to talk a little bit about uh, fundraising and investment sure. capital. Like I think um, I know there are not a lot of women that are driving investment funds, but that's changing. I've interviewed a few really amazing people, but yes. I think I heard that you guys have been, you guys worked on a fundraise through COVID. Is that true? We did. We worked on a fundraise through COVID, which, mm. you know, like all things during COVID launching a brand. <laughs> it was all, you know, different than anything we'd ever done before. Yes. Um, Jenny really, really took the lead on the fundraising and uh, she, I don't think she met anybody in person. She raised uh, all, our entire series A on Zoom, which is, you know, definitely not something we would have said before 2020. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that it's so interesting that you say that because of course, when I think of alcohol and spirits and, and uh, related there is a communal component to it just in general. And from a business standpoint, we're of course accustomed to meeting face-to-face -face and all of the trade shows shut down and, you know, lack of travel. And so I wonder if you felt like you were really able to fully express yourself in those kinds of conversations, or did you guys have to use new, new tricks? Like, uh, did you wear fancy hats? I know I'm being really <laughs> silly about it, but do you know what I mean? Like, did you find yourself aside from the technology using different ways to communicate and outreach to these pro prospective investors? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I've kind of across the board, it's just like, we, it was a learning for us in terms of sales, fundraising, everything. It was just really lear learning how to connect virtually mm -hmm. like, you know, like we're doing right now. Right. It's like every, like, so I don't, I don't know that there was like one specific thing that we did differently Okay. Um, for the, fundraise but it, I mean across the board it was just like how how to connect virtually it's like With so people. different and you know in some ways it's it became a little bit more personal which is kind of really? a weird thing to say but I also but I feel like you're you know zooming and like someone's kids running around yes. screaming or your mm -hmm. dog is barking or like you know after you know we started off being really professional and then everyone was like wearing sweatshirts <laughs> after a while you know so um so in some ways like that, I, I it was kind of, an, it's interesting to kind of see everyone in their like home environment. Um, and then in other ways, it's co completely impersonal, right? Because you're just staring at a screen. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we tried, we tried to make it as, you know, everything we do, we try to make as engaging as possible. And always, you know, have people have product before and make sure we're trying it or, you know, all, all that kind of stuff so that you can like have still have that interaction and yeah um, do the samplings and all the stuff that we used to do in person. Uh, yeah. But it's different, you know, but it's, we've all had to kind of just learn to adjust. Yeah. Did you feel like you and your team, like when you say you got more personal, was that more with your team than maybe with vendors or was it across the board that kind of like, yeah, I got to know humans better or deeper or differently? Was it across the board? Um, I would say it's across the board. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think, um, you know, some people that you wouldn't necessarily have had a video call with now I like, know, you know, I know what they look like and yeah. it's like, I zoom with every, it's like using with everybody now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where it's like, you That's probably true. just, we're going to pick up the phone and I don't know what, who their kids are, but now I do. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. I hadn't even so, thought of that. Yeah. How much so, of my, how much of my calls were on phones. Right. Like I don't, I, 
honestly don't think I like maybe had like two zoom meetings. I don't even think I had zoom on my mm. computer before, to be honest, mm-hmm. like everything was either in person or a dial up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it was, I don't know, you know, it, there's, but like I said, there's also like a huge value in, in, you know, connecting face to face. And yeah, that was obviously different, but I know, did you, there were some did, interesting pieces of it. Did you guys end up doing expo East? You didn't. Yeah. I was going and then I backed out yeah. like two weeks beforehand. The numbers just started feeling funny to me, but I'm feeling pretty calm, confident about, um, first of all, specialty food in Las Vegas. I'm so glad they, I mean, I love San Francisco. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. that location was just turning into a shit show. Excuse my Italian, as I'm going to say, like it was a little bit wild last time yeah. around. Yeah. 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 So I, so I'm, I'm actually pretty excited about where, um, to see what happens. I don't know if you guys will be going to that. And then so, so excited for Expo West. Cause I'm feeling really confident. Like that's going to go down. That's, that's happening for so. real, real. I'm, I'm hoping we're at a good place by then. Yeah. yeah. Feels like we're heading in that direction. <laughs> finally, finally. Fingers crossed. I know. Fingers finally. crossed is probably yeah. what yeah. just knock on wood, throw salt over my shirt. Yeah. All of it. All yeah. of it. Delete, delete that. Forget what you said. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, Maria, I, I have really enjoyed speaking with you and I'm enjoying our conversation. Uh, yeah, it's right about we're getting towards the end here. And there's a few questions that I like to add, uh, ask everybody across the board. Um, sure. Just really kind of fun, quick questions. The first one that is always interesting to me is kind of like, um, do you have like a, I'll call it a happy hour fact something that people could go did you know this about al's brew or about tea or about the in- beverage industry do you have anything fun to share lots of fun stuff okay, okay. Well, this is maybe not so fun i know i mentioned this before okay. but i have to say this was like the most like mind-blowing thing for me um was the deal with natural flavors so maybe i'll explain that a little bit more. yes but mm-hmm. um almost every beverage and this is not just an alcohol thing this right. is like non alk it's everywhere food you like look and it says natural flavors and you're like mm-hmm. okay that must be natural and good and therefore i'm like paying a premium for this natural product yes so when we started getting sent to flavor houses we started being like well why you know they were like what we'll use like I don't know, raspberry flavor and we're like well, why not just raspberry and they're like oh well it's like you know we're like okay, well what's actually in that and they're like no no raspberry and you're like what <laughs> why <laughs> and so the more layers we started pulling back you just realized that it's like honestly like a loophole in like fda labeling and and the only difference between a natural flavor and an artificial flavor which we like all know is bad right it's an artificial right is the um the original base of it is from something from the earth so it's organic can, uh-huh. not even organic just like from the earth so oh. it could be like it could be like a fish or like raspberry, for example, can be made from beaver's anal glands. Raspberry okay. natural flavor. Yeah. Um, okay. So anyway, all that stuff was like, and that's why they can't say that like they're vegan because some of them have like an- oh, animal byproducts. Interesting. Really? Yep. So that's wow. my like fun factoid. And I mean, they're so they're synthesized in a lab. Um, yeah. They're, they can be made with up, a, up to a hundred chemicals and there's like mm-hmm. literally no nutritional mm-hmm. benefit to having a natural flavor versus an artificial flavor. Mm-hmm. They're essentially chemically the same by the time they make it into your products. So um, that was my like eye-opening factoid. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I, and of course that's true across all food products, across uh, um, all categories. And, and then also with skincare and supplements, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. I think you have to yeah, understand what natural means. Yeah. I mean, I think the clean beauty movement is something that we, we look at a lot. Um, I think the beauty had a similar kind of like hidden ingredient platform <laughs> that, yeah. that this is prevalent in food. And, um, you know, our one, we say actually like one of our goals is really to be like the, a clean beauty brand and alcohol. Yeah. Like we want to be yeah. a boozy tea brand. Yeah. Um, and, uh, they, they, they had the same thing with like fragrance and what could be hidden in the word fragrance. Exactly. And feeling it back. You're like, wait, what tar, like all this crazy yeah. stuff. So. Yeah. Or yeah. Scent blockers to make things unscented, but you know, it's a little bit challenging, right? Like, let's be honest. There's, you've got shelf stable shelf stability, some natural ingredients, 
don't have a shelf life. Like there are, there are things, sometimes we require some of those artificial things, but I think honesty about that in the labeling. I think the transparency is really what was like, you know, you should just know what it is that you're, is our belief. Like you should know what it is you're putting. Absolutely. (laughs) But I think when you're a brand platform or not a brand platform, but when you're a brand like Owl's Brew and you guys can um, talk the talk and walk the walk, which, you know, your website does, it'll really kind of add some validity to what you're trying to deliver at the end of the day. It's the ones that go, we are natural. And then you find out that they're not. And that's, that's what starts to confuse the consumer and it upsets people and blah, blah, blah. But I think, uh, very, very, very interesting reminder (laughs) of where, um, artificial comes from. Uh, so thanks. Thanks for that. That will be, I don't know how well that's going to go over during a happy hour. Conversation. Yeah. I don't know if that's like the happiest happy hour topic. Um, uh, it could be an interesting one. Yeah, it could be for some people. Can, it absolutely is. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say, I can tell you if, if you would like a happier, happy, a happier, story, happy hour. Topic. No, yeah. no, yeah. no. I mean, if there's something else you want to share, that's totally fine. But yeah. this one yeah. was like really, really great. I love it. Memorable, at least. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That is for sure. Um, are there any other women leaders or rising stars in our industry or not that you would like to elevate for the work that they're doing or just simply admire? All the women. All the- <laughs> go, go, ladies. Go, um, ladies. But I mean, uh, I, if I was going to say one, it, it would definitely be, um, Christine Parrish. She, um, is, uh, was formerly the CEO, COO and CFO of New Belgium, which actually happens to be one of the very few, um, women owned breweries, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. also plug to them. Um, but no, she's, she's awesome. She's been an advisor mentor, okay. um, for years, um, for us and is just, she's a rock star and she was, you know, definitely one of the first female leaders. So I Shout love it. <laughs> mm, I'll have to go and look her up. Yeah. She's, she's great. Awesome. Uh, what brands or trends in category or not, uh, do you have your eye on and why? Um, so, I mean, I would definitely say this is in category, but just like the general better for you category. I'm like yeah. super excited about this. Like just like shift that the category is making with like mm-hmm. hard kombuchas and other, you know, alternative brands and mm-hmm. stuff that, you know, is clean and transparent and all the stuff that we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it really is the future of how we're all going to drink. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, other than that, you know, I, I, I guess I just mentioned this too, but clean beauty is, it, I, I, I've looked a lot at that category and the trends there and, you know, they're a little, they're more established in terms of their clean movement, but I, as we just said, they had kind of a similar problem. So I think it's kind of amazing to see where they are now. And, you know, you shop Sephora and you just shop clean. Like, yes. wouldn't that be a cool, like, future in a grocery store? So, yes. Um, I, I've, I've watched a lot what's happened in that in that category. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. Uh, her name is escaping me. I interviewed this amazing woman who started a supplement brand, clean supplement brand, but before that, she ran a business working with the burgeoning clean ingredient um, on be- on the beauty side because she had um, science background. I wish I could remember her name now. She has amazing blonde hair. In any case, she <laughs> talked about the fact that these beauty brands were having a hard time finding manufacturers because of the volume that they needed to do. So she was helping these brands by basically starting a manufacturing um, or, or co-man that allowed oh. to package a minimum of, of 100, 100 units so that they could get these products out in the more market and get trial because the big beauty brands were blocking accessibility and availability. Um, she's just brilliant. But she, she was the one that talked about a lot of the um, ingredients used in beauty that were used to mask. And so she's like, not only do you have you know, products that are non-clean that are saying we're better for you, but this, they would do that by using 
even more ingredients to block all the things that they were saying they, if that makes any sense, what I'm saying. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, beauty. It's, that's a whole nother thing. It's a whole keep on peeling the layers. I can't even pretend to be an expert on it, but I've, I have also talked to a bunch of people that I I feel like wild. You're like, Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) It's crazy. (laughs) Well, we have been talking with Maria Littlefield, the co-founder and COO of Owl's Brew. Maria, if people want to learn more about you and Owl's Brew, where, where would you send them? Absolutely. So you can check out our website. It's theowlsbrew.com or follow us on Instagram. It's at the Owl's Brew. Mm, what's the current Owl's Brew fave for you right now? So it's like, it's very hard to pick a favorite child, if you will, I but know. no, no, I, I I'll just say, say for today, we just launched, um, oh my, hold on. You're good. We just launched our spice chai and cranberry, <gasps> uh, which is our seasonal. I know. And it's, um, like cinnamon, cloves, ginger, cardamom with a little bit of cranberry and apple. No. Um, oh and gosh. it is freaking delicious. I am obsessed. Um, so keep okay. your eye out for that. It's, um, it's hitting markets like right now. It's our, it's our yes. first season also nationwide we're excited about it. Yep. In all of our markets. So we're available in 18 markets and, okay. uh, we ship to 32. Um, okay. so I love it. And I love that. It's not pumpkin spice. I like that. You're not pumpkin spice. girl, <laughs> not pumpkin spice. You could have oh, we, gone we there, we'd right? shake it up a little. Yeah. I know. <laughs> well, let's be fair. I don't want it. You know, if you love pumpkin spice, bless you. Right. No, no problem. But for those of us that aren't fans, we like to have something a little different. Al's brew. Thank you for checking that box. All right. Well, Maria, I want to thank you so much for your time today and, and for the work that you're doing, especially kind of raising that next generation of leaders in beverage and alcohol. Um, CPG love it. Excited to see what you tackle next. And, um, I want to thank you for sending some of the samples. I know I had to uh, block and tackle to make sure my team didn't take all of them before because they, (laughs) they came into the office a day that I wasn't there and I came in and I'm like, what in the heck is going on here? There's it's all gone. You know, I'm like, had to go and snag them off people's desks and, and um, put my name on them in the fridge. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, it sounds like we have to get you some spice try. So well, well, we might, <laughs> we might, we might, we might. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Have a great rest of the day. And to the rest of you, we'll catch you next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you haven't already, be sure to click subscribe and share with your network. Until next time, be well and do gooder. Gooder.